Hey, yo, so this be a clip from a recent Raw chat I had with Daryl Sloan, author of a book called I, Universe, Demolishing and Rebuilding Spirituality for a Scientific Age. Daryl and I chatted about, uh, well, about the subjects you see in the title, consciousness, the nature of space and time, and Daryl's view that spirituality must be rebuilt for a scientific age and why. We also touched on high and low magic, and that's the focus of this clip that you are about to hear. If you enjoy it, the full-length Raw episode is available for patrons on Patreon at the level of $5 a month and up. So if you're at the $2 level, it's easy to increase that to 5 or more. And if you're not and want to support the show and get access to content like this, the $5 level at patreon.com slash occulture is the place to do that. Anyway, here is Daryl Sloan and myself riffing on high and low magic. Enjoy. I do talk about magic in sort of the, the last quarter of the book, but it it is highly theoretical. For me, the only real interest I have in magic is in how much it actually supports uh, non-duality. Uh, it, it, I mean, people like Anton LaVey, he died in near poverty, essentially. So you would have to ask how much of a magician really was he if he wasn't able to use that to bring material success for himself in the final quarter of his life, you know? So I don't think magic or psychic things are really very useful for much. I know there's that book, uh, what's it called? The Secret by Ron de Byrne. I haven't read the book, but I watched the DVD once and I just thought it was just so totally over the top. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. This law of attraction thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, so I think there's some truth to the law of attraction because it's, it's essentially this idea that you use your state of mind in order to bring certain, bring certain things to, to bear in, in your life. But through exaggeration, uh, that book and that DVD just just ruins everything because it's just not that simple. Magic works with the existing flow of life. It's not some kind of thing that you can use to have an ace up your sleeve to make a million dollars or something like that or to get a, a superstar girlfriend or something. It, it just doesn't work like that. It's subtle. Same with the experiments in, in telekinesis. They work with conservation of energy laws you know i can't just make something levitate off the desk because the, where, where am i going to get the energy to do that where's it going to come from so it, it appears to be that the energy comes from the body so it's only very subtle things and i was i was never able to move a matchstick much as i tried even though i witnessed my friend doing it um i really only got as far as moving a side wheel under a glass bowl and even then it would only happen some of the time. Um, and I guess this is part of the reason why psychic things and magical things have never really entered science proper because they're just too slippery uh, for, for lab confirmation. Um, you know, you could have an experience where, let's say, you get a sudden feeling of dread that comes over you that something terrible has happened to a loved one. And then, 10 minutes later, you get a phone call to say they've been in a road traffic accident. You know, people report things like this, but you can't then say to that person who had that experience, okay, we're going to go to the lab and you're going to repeat this for me. It just doesn't work that way because they didn't know what they did to make that happen. And yet people have strange experiences. But like I say, I think, I think it's a misuse of par or it's a misuse of responsibility and it's probably worthless anyway to try and use the occult to benefit your life in some kind of dramatic way it's not really useful for that yeah well i think that you know that might enter uh some interesting territory in terms of you know the nature of magic and i uh i've been thinking recently about the ideas of high and low magic and what that means and like you mentioned, is that like, is that like greater and lesser magic? Yeah, you could probably, yeah, you could probably call it that too. Uh, but you know, like you mentioned LeVay dying in poverty and there's a, he's one of many examples of people who you would call magicians throughout the years or throughout the centuries 
that died in poverty, that died with like nothing to their name. And I think you have yeah, to like, Alistair, Alistair Crowley and Crowley, he was a deadbeat uh, yeah. dad as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, John, John D as well. You know, uh, this, this guy who's credited with a lot of, you know, sort of <laughs> just these great magical inventions, you know, for lack of better terms, but you know, he worked for the queen of England and then, but he dies in like poverty and like relative obscurity on some level and his legacy is forgotten you know for all these Mm -hmm. centuries so i think you have to look at though the ideas of greater or lesser magic or high or low magic and if that low magic is not what we're talking about like maybe these guys were not using magic for material gain you know maybe they weren't really trying to to live a life on that level. Like maybe they just didn't care so much about acquiring wealth or a, a, a better, you know, sort of material existence, which, you know, is probably important to a lot of people and why it would not be important to them. I don't know, but maybe also they were practicing magic on a higher level and it wasn't about that for them. You know, like you look at D's work and you look at LeVay's work and you see like, the art of it all, you know, sort of coming into focus the more that you study it. And it, it really is to me about like, maybe it's, maybe it's more about them creating something out of nothing, which you would call artistic on some level, and then having a large group of people then interact with it and also, you know, gain something from it. Because that to me is the power of magic, which is the power of art as well. You know, it's a power of creativity in general. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but that's kind of what I've been toying around with, this idea of like a like a higher, more artistic form of magic that's that's not really self-serving, that's like really meant to impact the people who interact with it afterwards, as opposed to like a lower form of magic where you are using it for, you know, sort of like money spells and love spells and those sorts of like things, and then it's impacting other people against their will and sort of like unknowingly like they're interacting with your spell not knowing it whereas that higher form of magic is you know like you write a book and people interact with that and they take lessons from that and you make a positive impact on them and that to me is the highest form of magic when people knowingly interact with with your spell so to speak and can can use it to better their own lives yeah i i get it i resonate with what you're saying there um Again, I guess for me, it comes down to um, what, you know, what's your view of ego? You know, if you're interested in magic, but you've got a really big ego, then you're going to use it for selfish means. But if you've got past that whole idea of ego, if you've got to grips with a philosophy like non-duality, where you essentially are very comfortable with the idea that you're not going to be here one day, which kind of makes you think, well, what's the point in accumulating wealth? Um, and you, you kind of understand that there isn't, there isn't a self that needs to be saved or, or really that needs to build itself. Well, then, yeah, ma- magic becomes something else then. It becomes something that you can do f- selflessly for others. But even, even beyond that, I think it's just there's just a real excitement about I mean, I could put it this way. I'm in touch with a side of reality here that even the great Stephen Hawking knows nothing about, right? So Stephen Hawking, now, I'm not comparing myself to Stephen Hawking in terms of physics. He was a brilliant physicist. I'm not even a physicist. So I'm not fit to tie the guy's shoelaces in his field, right? But the fact that I have had a paranormal experience that is incredibly valuable to me because it shows to me that there is a side of reality that is being almost universally ignored by the scientific community. So the great overarching uh, quest of Hawking's life was the theory of everything, find the theory of everything. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, yeah, but there's this side of, there's this side of life that you don't even know is there, but it really is. And unfortunately, it's actually finding this and coming stumbling across it is so hard because there's all these charlatans everywhere. Um, but it's real, and uh, to just to have that awareness that consciousness really matters, and consciousness it isn't just this lump of clay in the head. It's 
you know, it's spread out more than that. Uh, whatever, whatever abstract philosophy we put on it, you are more than just a thing sitting in the head. Because if that's all you are, then telekinesis and subtle forms of ESP, like that feeling of dread I talked about, those things can't happen in a world that's just purely materialistic. But they do happen. <laughs> so it, that's just, that just fills me with so much excitement to just know that you're in a minority of people who've had an experience that many scientifically inclined people would laugh at, yet you know it's real and uh, it informs you about reality. So that's really the value of, of magic and parapsychology for me.